everyone has a bright light inside of them that deserves to be seen by the world. That's why it's time to shine the light on the extraordinary who are accomplishing phenomenal things. This is the Shine Out Loud show with Lillian Ogbogo. So, good morning, good evening, good afternoon, wherever in the world you are. Yes, it's Lily Nabogo again, and we are back and back and back. I keep saying this because it's time for another episode of the Shine Out Loud show. And I have a young man who is an innovator, who is a change maker, who is making an impact in Africa across the continent. He is a young man who is dedicated to seeing that the fourth industrial revolution is not, is not missed by the African continent. And, it's, and he looks at solutions driven by Africans for Africa. And I am so honored to have him on the show today. Folks, join me and welcome Emmanuel Abeko Gamor. Emmanuel, how you doing? Good. Hello, hello. Thank you so much for having me on your platform, Lillian. It's a pleasure to be here and to engage with the audience. Awesome. So now, those who don't know you, you are, as you describe yourself with your bio, a consummate professional. You've, you have a decade long experience in youth <laughs> engagement. You have digital right. and managerial um, innovation and entrepreneurship. But the one thing that people may not know is your passion for leadership education. But, okay. but the flip side of that, you are a photojournalist, you are a podcaster, radio show host yourself. So you are so many things. So let me ask you this. When we strip away everything you are, you know, the co-chair of the World Economic Forum for Youth, the Global Shapers Advisory Council, an ex-Googler, you are um, a former YouTuber, um, YouTube country manager. You're all of this. But who is Emmanuel outside? If we shake out all the titles, who is Emmanuel? So I'm a person who's passionate about validating the Black experience. So what that means is I'm on my own growth, personal and professional journey, mm -hmm. and whatever skill sets, interests that validate the experience that I had, have the opportunity to be committed to, have the opportunity to express myself in, uh, which speaks to the arts and culture, speaks to the multimedia, um, and the opportunity to pass on, which also speaks to the opportunities to kind of teach and also learn um, and, and be a part of a continuous education journey. That's who Emmanuel is. Okay. So these, these kind of titles are um, maybe they're helpful because they're, they're almost like avatars you place on. So mm -hmm. if I identify a community that uh, aligns with my interests, like the global shapers, community-based hubs, impactful folks, some of the most amazing people in the world, there's a hub, um, of 10, well, there are 10,000 members in this hub in right. almost every major city across the world. I've been part of that for seven years. And because wow. of my engagement in that, I'm now the co-chair for Impact and Knowledge Council. So those, these titles help, they're almost like avatars, but who I am is someone that's passionate about validating my own and everyone's Black experience. Okay. So actually you brought up something about the black experience and I'm going to pin that because I want to come back to that and discuss, especially, in fact, let's talk about it now because I think it's pertinent because in the wake of the George Floyd situation, in the wake of the upheaval and change that is about to come, there's this, I, this is conversation about the black experience. And again, I'm going to start with this. Sometimes we are always in danger of being swallowed up by a single story. So let's start with this question. Is there a singular, in your mind, a singular black experience, or is it more nuanced than that when we start thinking about what it means to be a black person on the continent or a black person in Europe or a black person in the United States? Mm, interesting question. Um, and definitely, no. So the, the first response is, no, there's no single story. Chimamanda Adichie tries to, tries to do that. Um, quite a number of, I guess, political activists, academic luminaries, writers, and artists show that there's no black story. Mm -hmm. A fella is incredibly different from a Shade. Yes. Um, a burner boy is incredibly 
um, different from a Lauren Hill. Mm -hmm. And these are all, for us, we're all, whether in a diaspora on the continent, we're all from Africa, like black people, this is our home. Yeah. And I come from a family of folks who've been expats um, and slash immigrants, even from, from my parents' generation before that, um, to great ancestors I was sharing with you earlier, um, at least from my mother's side, I, we've traced part of our lineage from Sierra Leone. And we have folks who are in Nigeria and Burkina Faso, as well as those of us in Ghana. So I have uncles and aunties with Nigerian names, uh, like right. Olu and Ayodele, for example. Um, and my father is also you know, quite a, a, a mix of different spaces as well. And he, after living in Ghana, um, moved to Germany and then mm -hmm. lived in the United States. And right. before moving back to Ghana in the 80s, uh, my mom's been in the United States for over two decades. So I come from a family of folks who have been global citizens, regardless of where we were originally born, mm -hmm. um, and strongly tied to the African continent because of our lineage and legacy, but not boxed into one nationality or one experience. So for me, it's if you have a father who's half Togolese and speaks French and speaks German, um, and then you have a mom who, and you can hear from my accent, who's been in the United States for a long time, mm -hmm. you appreciate that just by um, heritage or colonial influence or culture, there's no one way of expressing who we are and what our validity means. Um, and not to tie it into our times, so there was an email that I kind of shared because one of the things that I've been trying to push is for us to own this time and moment that's been catalyzed by what the unfortunate situation of what happened with George Floyd. Yeah. But the Black Lives Matter movement and um, in spaces where I work and volunteer, I'm advocating for people to see that this is a human rights issue. Yes. This is an opportunity that's come face to face. So we're using the momentum to right a wrong that shouldn't have been there in the first place. And so there's an email that I had sending uh, to the Global Shapers and World Economic Forum community in 2015, when the Black Lives Matter as a hashtag and digital engagement was also relevant. Mm -hmm. So for me, it's a continuous journey. Um, and it goes beyond that. I think there are a couple of frameworks that I'm able to adapt in order to, one, make sense of the world that I'm in, and two, try to understand what is the best economic agent that I, I can be. One of the ones that I'm, I've been able to adopt and learn and continue to learn from is just feminist theory about displaced people, minorities, um, and a lot of people have variations that look at women, for example, but my understanding of the little I've read with feminist theory is just the opportunity for privilege um, not to be sequestered to just white people, the established mm -hmm. order that is capitalistic, but to a lot of marginalized communities. And so when you understand that as an anchor and basis for feminist theory, then you understand that as an anchor and basis for humanist theory, for, for accepting different things in ways that help us look at the Black Lives Matter movement as an expression of the various ways in which our Black lives can be expressed as black women, as young black men, as old black people, as black people who are in the Caribbean, as black people who are now considered to be African American, as third, fourth generation Liberian American, Sierra Leonean American, or just living on the continent, a particular um, country that you identify with. That nuance and variation is also valid. Um, yeah. So those were my early thoughts on, on the question. Okay. So that's, and, and that in itself is, I think to unpack that, that goes, and I think it's a lot deeper and there's a lot we can actually look at that. But I have so much other questions that I want to go through with you. So we'll pin that and come back to it. <laughs> All right, um, cool. And actually you, in that you said something about your family in terms of where some of you are, you, whether you're immigrants or expats. And I think there is, in that is a question in itself because when we start mm -hmm. thinking about, there's a viewpoint that if you're black and brown, you're an immigrant. If you are somebody else, if you're of other origins, you're an expat. So I think let's kind of let's kind of delve into that because I think there's a need to also respect as we have just identified there isn't one black experience. Not all black people right now are immigrants. Not all black people are refugees. We are also expats because we now travel to places and contribute to the society we find ourselves in. My parents were um, came to the UK to study. So they were educational um, expats. They came to study. They lived. They said, okay, they're here. They decided to raise a family. 
here. I've had the benefit also of being raised in, in Nigeria because that's my lineage. And at, so I think there's that conversation that needs to be had. How do you feel about this identity, this moniker that Black people are immigrants and others are expats? That was a great question. My, I typically like to give a caveat. So um, I'm a student of management, commerce. So a lot of the World Economic Forum, a lot of what I do in business, management and leadership speaks to that. Um, I, I say that so that your audience can appreciate. I'm not saying this from a sociology standpoint. I know there are quite a lot, a lot of luminaries and thought leaders on the impact of language and labeling and what that means and the narrative and ownership of people and especially of people from the global south and especially folks of black skin from the global south that interact in different places. Mm -hmm. And these challenges or these labels find their way in visa policy, they find their way in xenophobic treatments. So I'm not home in Ghana, I'm living in Johannesburg, South Africa now. And they find their way in um, just the lived experiences in social and professional life in ways that is deterrent. Um, when I share that, it's my, and, and it's less of a so sociology definition and more of um, economics definition of expat versus immigrants, where I think you also pointed out, for some some folks who are considered immigrants, it's usually because of strife or from other other social cultural reason that you're immigrating from one place to another. And the expat label kind of um, speaks more to a, a limited degree of shared professional skills and economic agency that you have. Um, and the sad thing about that is, and as much as those definitions maybe in and of themselves are not wrong, um, it's the categorization and making it seem that every white person in our black countries are expats, which some of them probably are immigrating from prosecution and all kinds of shady behavior. And that all black people who are, and most of us who are black people who can afford, um, are usually the top echelons of the country in academia and professional development and have gone on to become um, or to move on to these global North countries, but they're labeled immigrants without the recognition of the professional skills without the recognition of the lived black experience that they bring in addition to. Um, and I think that's critical because most of the rhetoric and media weaponizes the othering. And we've yes. seen that through the colonial times, we've seen that through industrial times, and othering has been a huge factor in the type of industrial complex over the industrial cycles that have been built. And so for me, it's, I think I'm privileged. Um, I have a a core group of people that I value their opinions who are um, interrogating this specifically on, on what it means for to be a black girl child being raised in how the global north um, looks at black girl children specifically. But through that process, I get to interact and borrow some of the learnings for me because as a black man um, who's, learned, who's learning about commerce and business, I cannot also be comfortable with just economic labels. Mm -hmm. I cannot just be comfortable with these kind of tears. So I guess that the short form of, of or way of answering your question is, I think that we are starting to, one, permeate these spaces where literature means so much. Mm -hmm. um, we're starting to see quite a number of folks. I have a good friend, Karen Atian, Washington Post opinion editor. We're starting to see a lot more black voices or minority voices or women's voices um, or Asian voices in adding nuance to otherwise flippant descriptors that don't do justice um, to who we are and to what we represent in terms of uh, lived cultural experiences and in terms of professional addition that we've been able to give and give freely without credit to the global world as well, not just the global north. So uh, yes, I think my parents and my family, we've been a mix of that. Most of, um, from at least my father and my mother's side, it has mm -hmm. been that. But um, and my mom, though, during the, so Ghana went through a process of having coup d'etats and, and, and having political leaders. So in the 90s, she left as a political refugee. Um, she was incredibly active that way. My father was working, but then repatriated, came back home <laughs> from the United States um, and, and as an expat. And, and so those, those languages are, are fluid, but definitely is important to point out because there's such um, a skewed use of those indicators and words in the media as we have it. And it does cloud how people are seen because it, it, it creates, like you said, it, a certain narrative in which we have to be mindful of. So you were born in Ghana, in Accra. Uh, did I pronounce it properly? 
In Accra, yes. Yeah, in Accra. And you were, my Ghanaian friends, please don't come for me. It's too early in the day. Please don't come for me. <laughs> you didn't, you didn't, it's good jollof. <laughs> <laughs> Got you. <laughs> we'll bless your life. We'll set it, we'll FedEx you a good pack of Ghanaian jollof. Go ahead. You, it's, listen, it's too early in this interview <laughs> to start the, start the jollof. No, it's, it's too, yes. it's I will pack it. I'll put it away. You can go ahead. I'm, I'm ready for you, Lily. Okay. All right. So I, I see how you want to play, Manuel. I see how you want to play. Okay. We're going to do the jollof wars in a moment, but I've been told, categorically speaking, as a Nigerian, as a yes. West African, yes. that Senegalese is the best. So... No, I'm, and, I, and I've heard that too. I haven't had the <laughs> privilege of having their jollof rice. Neither which, have I. Which, which is something that is on my bucket list right after Corona. I just need for them to stand up for what is good too. If if they're able to advocate for their jollof half as much as Nigerians are able to advocate for what they have going on, hey, I, would, hey, I think hey, we would hey, meet halfway. Hey, so I, I'm hey, open. I'm hey, open. Emmanuel, Emmanuel, I, I, I see, I see the digs. I see the digs. Listen, listen. I will have you know. No. I will no, have I, you know. <laughs> Nigerian jollof is great. Um, Nigerian jollof that, is where it is. I, I had a conversation with uh, Babala Basanjo yesterday, and we were joking. Um, and he was talking about well, the most important thing for him was that um, it's homegrown rice that makes it off, which is an extension of what we're talking about, right? So, and as much as we, we speak of that, then having such a, a West African branded staple, there's no mm -hmm. reason why it shouldn't be homegrown Nigerian rice, homegrown Senegalese rice, homegrown Ghanaian rice. Mm -hmm. It provides this. Um, brand, so yes. And I think that's that's in itself. It's speaking to the element. As much as we joke about the jello rice wars, I think, and I think it's 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 funny that we have a thing that is internal that you even have those uh, the outside of outside of the continent going. Yeah, we know about these wars. We're not getting involved. Because I, yeah. I, I, I have I have my too. American friends. Too. I have my American yeah. friends going. We're not getting involved in this. We don't know. <laughs> and to be fair, I think even for most of my my um, learning life, so I went to University of Florida and Gainesville, mm -hmm. Florida, a, a large, large population of those at the um, International Students Union, and I eventually was president of that um, before campus involvement director, were Nigerians and Ghanaians. And so, like, there's such a symbiotic relationship. Like, mm -hmm. so the reason why people don't get involved is because if you say anything bad about either country, we will band yeah. up in West we Africa against you. It's like so fighting it's, a sibling. You know when you have those sibling exactly, rivalries absolutely. and you're fighting absolutely. your sibling and you will yeah. you will fight your siblings to the end, but somebody comes in and you're like, wait. Hold, you would compete hold, hold with this. your siblings because it's, it's family wealth. <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, that, that hold this. Right. Let's deal with this over there. So, yeah, people know. They're like, don't get no, 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 no. But we, 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 we are divert, diverting. I wanted to ask, what was one of the pivotal factors that made you move back from the States to Ghana? Good question. Um, right after college, I did get involved with an African organization and then a community newspaper called The New Ghanaian. So even though I was away, I was um, managing editor for the newspaper for a while. And mm -hmm. it allowed me to engage with both the Ghanaian embassy at the time um, President Kofo was around and we had a couple of sweeping um, kind of policy that including the millennial compact arrangement. So mm -hmm. on the diaspora side, I was still fairly engaged with Ghana. Like I left Ghana when I was 16. I wasn't right. really young. So I finished um, boarding school at Presbyterian Board Secondary School for sec at the time. So I was uh, in mentally still engaged, um, but my father fell ill. Um, my father fell into a coma. And so I bought a one-way ticket knowing that in 2012, that I would be in Ghana indefinitely. Um, I didn't want to come in and say, well, this is when I'm expecting my dad to recover or not. Um, he, he was quite old. Um, so that also changed my perspective a little bit. And then I, I restarted a career um, on the continent again. Okay. So one of the things that you talk about quite frequently is the power of storytelling and how we are how we are seen with stories. So tell me, how did storytelling land you a job with Google? That's a great, great question too. Um, so typically my family is, is a family that's been engaged in advocacy for a while. So I was telling, talking a little bit about my mother um, and right after the PNDC era, 
um, her leaving Ghana. Um, but we also come from a family of journalists. So my uncle, um, the independence, he started the independence and he was jailed for reporting atrocities during the PNDC era. So I, I was living with him when he was jailed um, for, for about two weeks at the time. And so for us, and I grew up understanding like pen is mightier than the sword, um, the, the impact of words and helping build democracy, the opinions. Um, but then an extension of that, um, studying political science also, I, I, I came to believe and, and appreciate words like the Bill of Rights, a constitution. I think mm -hmm. for a lot of folks who may not take um, literature and literary words as seriously, when you look at it, our laws are based on the expression, both understanding of the words that we share. Yes. And these things are actually um, a projection of, our laws are, are built around our cultural norms and uh, who we identify and what we identify as. So for me, I, I feel as if, if you have the ability to understand words and ability to share and tell stories, you have the ability to co-create a cultural space that makes people comfortable. Mm -hmm. And by doing that, um, then you have the legal experts, then you have the judicial branch. They enforce these norms that you've articulated matter to you. And so uh, without sounding grandiose or making it um, seem larger than life, our stories really are what determine how we're appreciated. Our stories determine how we see ourselves. Our stories are what tell our children how to future cast and have dreams. And our stories are what, again, goes to the original question, when you shake me down, what is left? Our stories are what help validate our experiences. Mm. Um, so, yeah. So that's that's that when you when you extrapolate stories like that, when you break it out into into its full form, a story is more than once upon a time. I, you know, a story creates the mural of one's life. So, but I'm still curious. How did you translate that your mural, your story, your background? into a job at Google. I'm, I'm asking for friends, you know. Yes. Didn't take <laughs> yeah, excellent. Well, no, I think it's a series of really um, opportune things. So um, for those Things Fall Apart, Janelle Chebe has a, a, a book that we read back in Ghana. So we had a choice of either reading Macbeth, Shakespeare's Macbeth, or mm -hmm. Things Fall Apart. So I know what I picked. But I think what that, that early um, narrative did was that we ha also had a history, we also had a fight, we also had our own validation of whether you agreed with it or not, what mm -hmm. work meant to us um, in some shape or form. So for me, like whilst I was in college, initially I wanted to go into law, but I've always, um, so my senior year, I uh, minored in photojournalism and leadership mm -hmm. and realized that that was actually what I would love to do. That's that's the kind of legacy I'd like to leave, be able to, to one, appreciate the fact that I, I was really good at what I did. So I, I got a full scholarship to go to Florida, but how could I use those skills beyond what my own aspirations could be, right? Mm -hmm. So in coming back to Ghana, um, I'd applied for a job and because I hadn't done national service, I didn't get it. Um, so whilst just looking for jobs, I was um, taking pictures. Um, I was part of the Ghana Decides um, kind of, reporting campaign for the 2012 elections. Okay. Um, I was part of different campaigns where photographers where we're going into communities. And one of the um, ones that I really loved was to an orphanage and taking portraits of a lot of the, the teenage young kids and giving it to them so that they could see, so they were allowed to dress up in whatever they wanted. Cause that imagery, again, validates your experience. Oh yeah. Um, and so I, I had a started a, a photo blog in undergrad at the time, but when I went to Ghana, I kickstarted it and it became kind of like my outlet for the advocacy for um, young people asking for political freedom. Um, the, the lens that I would lend to quite a number of people in my country that didn't have the photojournalistic experience I had. Mm -hmm. um, so leading up to that, I think just before I got off of the job, I was named the best um, blogger. Ghana decides at an award show. Mm -hmm. um, a friend of mine and I had also started um, a radio show called Empower. So it was literally Empower without the vowels. Um, she'd also gone to Cornell. She was also um, president of a Greek organization when she was an undergrad. We had a lot in shared um, experience, but she was also from Ghana originally. So Amabwaja and I co-produced, co-hosted the show. 
And the whole point of Empower was that by telling or having folks come on our show and share their testimony or the experience, um, they were, were able to then let people know that folks like them within our context could also right. be better. They're, they're empowered to also dream. They're empowered to be able to have aspirations. And so um, at the time, it wasn't publicly known, but internally they were looking for somebody to join the group team as a programs manager, mm -hmm. um, one for community curation, um, and then two, to look at YouTube. So then I transitioned from Google project manager to representing Google on the country okay. level and staff. Um, and then I was able to pitch to my boss at the time to host YouTube huddles where I'd train as many folks um, on Google's dime as possible at um, a community space. It was iSpace at the time, also co-founded, supported by Google, how to tell their stories. So quite a number of social entrepreneurs now, quite a number of initiatives, uh, quite a number of folks who didn't before have video applications for your realities or um, have ways in connecting with the rest of the world for what right. they want. Um, that became a great outlet to amplify the little that I'd learned to spread to other people and into their initiatives. So that's, that's really how uh, sharing my own story, um, honing in on the craft that I learned and then making sure that it represented and I think there's somewhere, if you Google it, there's a Google Africa Connected um, competition where Google flew in a, a videographer to follow my story. So this was even before the job opening. And the show became, I think we were semi-finalists because we were using a radio show, but the radio show had given us a really bad time slot. It was from 10 p.m. to midnight on Sundays. Oh, wow. Um, for what I'm telling you, right. <laughs> Nobody's so, listening. <laughs> And it was it was it was actually it was actually fascinating. But Am and I are resilient, so we decided to use that as the pre-recording. So I built a website. We had um, podcasts. We had so we were using a lot of online tools to have engagement during the course of the week. And mm. after every few episodes um, broken down into seasons, we had in-person soirees. So we mm -hmm. would invite all the all the guests who'd come in because we also felt that outside of just auditory or digital, there was something to people meeting having your business cards, sharing ideas, having that bond. Um, so co-creating an ecosystem. So those were, those were my early pilots of building an ecosystem in Accra at that time. Um, and that, that, I guess, caught their attention. We didn't win the prize, but then um, I was asked to, to join the Google team there and continue the good work. Okay. Well, you may not have won the prize. What you won was a platform to actually elevate and really tell that story so i think the prize is irrelevant at this stage uh, <laughs> it's, it's irrelevant so i'm i'm looking at at this and there is so much that i want to pick through what you've just said and i'm going to come back to a few key points but we know that storytelling is not just important for you it is super critical and you talk about being that your love of story started with your fascination almost as a young child wanting to hear the stories from your elders what was it about the stories of your elders that held your attention that captured your spirit because i i i personally have heard some family stories and i look at my my eldest telling depends on which of the elders telling you like really and then you do some research you're like wait that's true so right. what what was it that captured your spirit to listen to sit and be still to listen to those stories? Well, so I think for us, and, and maybe different families have, and, and I think there's, there's a recent um, kind of study around family owned businesses that we really do pass on a lot of knowledge whether, whether we like it or not. And mm -hmm. so like I was telling you, my family is a family of journalists. So they've, they've been part of history building and institution building for a whole country. I have uncles who've worked in the previous administration as a special assistant to the president. I have aunts who are current members of parliament. Mm -hmm. And I think for us, the joy and my personal, um, and I enjoy this a lot, is Christmas where I go to the family head. And so everybody kind of, we all find our way there for that with Christmas lunch. And so you have uncles, aunties, cousins, um, regardless of the political divide from different places. Mm -hmm. And we're all talking and sharing. And then you get the nuance of what's going on. So it's no longer the sound bites that maybe half a page or a radio broadcast would capture. There's a story behind the story. And then a lot of times it's a buildup that leads to it. Why was this decision taken? Why was this made? Um, I have a second aunt who's on the Supreme Court um, Justice 
of Ghana as well. So okay. we're a family that I think for us, it wasn't necessarily like individual, like, oh, a good one is um, my grandfather and so, and his, his um, cousin was vice president um, at some point in time on my mother's side. And there was this rumor about the, the president, the head of state's wanting like slapping him. <laughs> Like, yeah, it was reported in the news and others. Oh, and so wow. you come home and you hear, because he, he was, um, Rawlings at the time, PNDC was a head of state. He was a military mm-hmm. um, dictator so after the coup d'etat. So he had this military um, kind of punitive leadership style. And, and so you hear this and you hear about how he was able to, the retribution, what he thought at the time, what he was able to do, what he felt he was, in a way that it wouldn't come up in the, in the sound bites and others, mm-hmm. right? Um, and, and so for me, it was those type of stories came from home, then I read about them. Right. And so that link for me is like, oh, wait a minute, we're the ones that helped create history. And so it became even more important that than those of us who are blessed with the ability to to share in multiple languages, particularly in global language, like this foreign language I'm able to speak well. Yeah. It is a, a responsibility for us then to be the um, the griots um, that the global north can actually hear and understand so that we carry through our history as well. Wow. And I think that in itself, that that's that's an earful and, a, uh, and that in itself is where you understand the power of telling your story. When you can take your story and share it to others, it is your responsibility to do so because it creates, it joins up. So they're not looking for the sound bites. You're not looking for a media skewed view. You are telling that story because it's a lived ex- experience. I like that. And I think I'm going to keep that point about it being it. It is your duty to do. Absolutely. So you define yourself as a ecosystems builder. Now, I, I read that and I looked and I'm like, okay, he's going to have to explain this to me. Because in, your, in the issue of the VUCA Lifestyle Magazine, where you were the cover, you, you saw that. What in the world is an ecosystems builder, please? enlighten me thank you and again i'm very grateful to harisha and her team um, we met at vitz business school so she was wrapping up her mba program and i think she's a chief innovation officer for the vuka magazine mm-hmm. and she so so we met in an academic setting and then fairly like a month ago we reconnected because we met i think in 2018 right. and she was like hey you're gonna be the first black male cover for our magazine okay um and typically I'm not, and as much as I like to communicate, like I've, I've, I'm, I'm a multimedia, trained multimedia journalist. I'm great with submitting articles and others. This is the first magazine that was um, a bit personal. And I think that it was important because over the last um, three years, when I was, especially when I was teaching in Africa Leadership University Entrepreneurship, I've realized not just having black people, but a, a certain type of representation mattered. Mm-hmm. Um, and I'd give an example. Um, so in 2019, when I was invited to go to Davos at the time, so my mom is fairly conservative and as much as she's politically rebellious, my hair was a mohawk. It was, I think in the last year or two has become so much more accepted. And, but at the time she was like, you're, you're going where to Switzerland. You're going to be broadcast where on BBC and you're going to be on the panel. And, and there was a, a bank of America ad that I did on, on education and the Mm -hmm. idea of it was that we need to appreciate all the stakeholders in education especially teachers and facilitators because a lot of what's happening within the edtech spaces we are almost funding or being told to fund technology in the absence of translation and that's not the lived black experience and that's not Mm -hmm. the lived education experience Uh, and especially because we can't afford it so in the global north you can pretend that a laptop would replace your teacher all you want but on the global south that's not even an issue and these these development policies that are being built with one laptop per child yeah it's not not going to work um so as an ecosystem builder i felt a, a responsibility to share what I, I did in my classroom. So in right. Mauritius, um, the black Creole Mauritians have hairstyles and patterns that they put in their hair. Mm-hmm. And so when I was there, I, I felt comfortable doing it. And so on the global stage, I had to do it too. Um, and I shared this example and my mom, <laughs> so her, her, somebody at work called her, she's like, 
I see your son is on TV. Is that your son? Is that Pai? She was so super excited. And so the camera then pants the side of my head. And my mom just called it. She's yelling. She's like, why did you do the hair? She's going crazy. And I was like, yeah. I, and, and it was, it, for me, it was like, yeah, I understand where she was coming from. But for my students, it was amazing. Like, um, I had students who retweeted then some of their best memories in college, which is feeling like whatever style they had was validated, mm -hmm. right? Imagine going into schools and then having professors with Lily in your hair that you have or, or have representing that and that being okay. Um, so to, to translate that back into what ecosystem building is, mm -hmm. um, I, I do have um, a set of different talents that allows me to play in media, digital, e commerce, business. I've been working since I was 16, so it's over 15 years now, um, nice. or about 15 years now. So it's, it's one of those gifts that I have a chance to do very well for myself individually. Mm -hmm. But when, when, I, when you have a framework of ecosystem building, it means that as I'm going along, each step of the way, I'm building ladders for other people to also climb up for. And that is, that is a very intentional aspect. It means that in which ways do I actively transfer skills, sometimes for folks who may not be able to um, afford it, in which ways do I make myself available Mm -hmm. um, informal and formal communities, whether it's on WhatsApp mentorship groups and face-to-face. -face. Um, and even more so, not that I, I, I don't believe in making money, I'm into um, profit and sustainability. How then do I also connect the dots between organizations? So um, the last couple of months, I've accepted a role with the Ministry of um, Tourism, Arts and Culture in Ghana, the Ghana right. Tourism Board because we're, we're leveraging the year of return um, of which like my cousins and business partners and friends hosted events. But I'm one of the liaisons on the government side as well as we right. build beyond the return. So, so then it's no longer, okay, we see an opportunity. Yes, we have enough money to capitalize. Now it's like, no, we're at the table, seat of the table and saying, wait, there's this demographic that's missing. This is my influence and this is why they matter. Right. right. And that way it is. It's, it's um, again, building ladders and, and hopefully creating maps for other people to also follow and hopefully do better than, than I did or I have. OK, so I'm actually super impressed. And the this in itself is is the key to sustainability, not just on the continent, but for every black community anywhere else because the problem we talk about when we talk about being in corporate worlds is that we do not have the access now i did a talk um, in march for international women's day and we're talking about leadership and women in leadership and one of the key things they keep touting the glass ceiling being an issue of leadership for women and i go well, consider this, that, let me ask you a question before I continue. How many women in the UK are CEOs of Fortune 500 companies? You want to take a rough guess? Oof, maybe the, like, what, less than 10% Let's CEOs in the UK? I don't, I don't, I need to follow, I'm more familiar with the US, but it's a very slim and, and embarrassing minority okay so let me put it this way and i'll actually tell you the figures there are more people named johns and steves than there are female ceos and at the last check it was six women wait six individuals what well sorry there were seven but one had recently resigned and so when we're talking about ceos and talking about leadership and they're saying oh it's a glass ceiling thing and my response was women especially women minority women are stuck in a position where they're like where is this illusionary glass ceiling because they can't find the first rung of the ladder so having ecosystems that allow them to scale that ladder that give them pathways is super critical so whether it's on the continent or further afield what you do is actually super super critical thank you yeah thank you um and i, I think one of there there are a few things that have helped me come to this uh, what i would call so 
one is my mom and we have a we have a very close relationship where we have our annual mantras so mm-hmm. like this year's momentum and a second one is also just being a student of industry and business like I want the countries that I'm from or the countries I visit in the global south to do just as well if not better than the countries that my parents felt like they had to be expats or migrate to that's that's always been something from from when I was a child and that's also been something that my father brought back when he moved from New York and came back in the 80s he was like he's never going to live in the United States and I was like hmm but then there's a concession to that having Mm -hmm. that access it's almost like a recognized but I would be having to trade off this Um, and I think that for a lot of people I would love um, because everybody's on their own journeys Mm -hmm. to acknowledge this other part the third part for me is the most critical um, I think as millennials, we're vocal. As young folks, we're vocal. Generation behind us would be vocal. Because I'm engaged with my family of luminaries, it's quite easy to look at them and say, "Well, you didn't do X, Y, Z." So at family dinners, I, you can we can go to my I can go to some of my uncles and aunts who's been in leadership, and they and they speak about their passion leading up, and then how quickly that opportunity is gone. Mm -hmm. Um, or sometimes how restrictive it is when you are the first and only Mm -hmm. when you are the that group because then your efforts are so little to a systematic uh, malfeasance or a problem or structure that then the next generation doesn't benefit so for me it's almost um, for me it, it makes logical sense that we must try the ecosystem as much as possible because then it amplifies our interventions beyond what our individual capabilities can do it creates awareness within a community it allows other people who may find value in the foundation or roots principles you're advocating for Mm -hmm. but it also allows them to be adaptive and extended so that's why like the black lives movement again is everything to me when people look at civil rights and just in the united states case part of the policy that came out of that because of civil rights movement allowed folks um, from different countries because quotas on on travel to the United States were removed on the back of that. Mm-hmm. Women's suffrage were removed on the back of that. So a lot of these things, because they were tied in politically, they thought, well, oh, you want your suffrage. Well, guess what? Let's tie it into Black people getting freedom. But you realize that once you start to hack away at a specific group, and if it's done in a community basis, it allows other groups to also feel empowered, and it allows their voices to be heard, and it allows everybody to live in a, a much better um, conducive environment. Yes. Um, last thing I'll say, there's a video about um, somebody asking why are white men so scared and white people so scared? And I was just like, well, if they created a better world for all of us without them being so selfish, they'd not feel intrinsically threatened. If you if you create a world that is economically enabling and, them some, and folks don't feel like they need to resort to taking away what's been taken from them, you will probably go to sleep much better at night too. I'll leave it at that. <laughs> that in itself is a can of worms, but there's, I think there is also when you create a system that has played off on the back of where you have the elite that has created a narrative that says, if you allow X, Y, and Z, they will take away from you. So the little you have, they're coming to take it from you. Because that has been the narrative that's been used not just in the United States, it's been used in the UK, it's been used everywhere. And it creates this us versus them story. So those stories, and this is again, going back to the storytelling, how you tell those stories and put those stories out is key to change. Such a poverty mindset, like as if like it's finite, right? So the, the, the lived experience of yours, you are worth only a billion or a trillion US dollars. That's that's your whole value in life. That's what you were brought on for. T- that's such a poverty mindset. Anyways. <sighs> we do not have the full time to go into that because that will take us down a mighty, mighty wormhole, even though I am so tempted to go down that wormhole with you, Emmanuel, because it's absolutely fascinating talking with you. Um, you talk about technology and innovation as the catalyst to sustainable prosperity in Africa. How do you see that working? Because right now, technology in places, there are places still that technology is still lagging behind. Great question. Um, I think one of the frameworks that I like to adopt, so I spoke a bit about 
feminist theory, um, humanist theory and others is another around definition. So I think most people think of tech as specific tech, hardware and software that's coming out of Silicon Valley or mm -hmm. um, some noun, at least that's a bit of an appreciation of Chinese technology in itself. But the original definition of these are tools, tools and gadgets and um, inventions that help you do things more efficiently. And on our continent, we've, we've owned tech before. We've owned the opportunity for having frontier technology that's been adopted. Um, writings, um, abacus, um, understanding seasons and suns, scripts and scrolls, um, mm -hmm. linguistics. I think there's a lot of inbuilt technology and sustainable living that we have that's not captured in the way that um, typically capital markets and commercialization works. What that does though is as a student of innovation, we believe that innovation is everywhere. Mm -hmm. And for for you to even look at that, a, a good example is German innovation, British innovation, and economic wars that, that follow. Um, and even for the United States, for they having to find management innovation in Japan. Mm -hmm. And even being dominant after the war, realizing that Japanese efficiency and management was kicking their behinds in General Motors and Fords in the 80s. The thing about the United States or the global north system is that capital market and funding so to have innovation you do need and it's it's usually been sequestered to those with funds to invest in the research and development yeah. and that aspect takes quite a bit of money and that's where um we are on the continent at a disadvantage the fact that we're still critical it's almost as if if you have um um if and this is a purely economic term it's just for this example, I don't think of human beings being just economic agents, mm -hmm. but it's relevance in the progression, right? So for us, if you have about 50 years of economic life out of your 70 or 80 years um, life, lifespan, mm -hmm. your first 20 years you're being provided for, you're learning. There's very little um, maximization of your efforts or your thinking that can translate to you being the most economic agent. It's really from your mid twenties, thirties, for most people, they cap up in the forties and fifties. If you skimp on your nutrition, if you don't have a healthy body, healthy mind, or you're not being, you're not learning tools that allow you to be that economic agent. And the flip side is you have a similar, a clone of you, a twin of you, um, biologically, perfect in every way and that person is eating that person is eating well it's taking care of their mental space that person is learning you realize that at every stage of their work life they progress exponentially ahead of you so if at 30 you don't have good eating habits you you have um all kinds of uh, uh, preventable diseases that are affecting you there's no way you're going to maximize your economic potential the reason i say that and i use a human example is because then it lets your audience take ownership of what's happening with our countries so if you personify every country and you realize that from our global south journeys to our global north and you can even now with papers coming out of asia and others we've gone to a space where our body our countries as a person have been traumatized gone through wars there's still countries on the continent that have civil wars there's still yeah. countries that are being exploited but then we're comparing what we want to see from countries that have been liberated, had the freedom to explore their own economics, broadcast their culture and arts through Hollywood for over a hundred years. And some countries have just been existence or broken away from parts, either colonial or apartheid regime in less than 30 years. Yeah. So that comparison one is not fair. You wouldn't compare somebody who is as, um, who had a monarchist past, whatever, to somebody that's an athlete that's had access to, all kinds of facilities and others yeah. in order to perform at the world stage. That being said, you also have to start then fixing the problem at the root cause because you realize that you're still going to be on this race. So as countries now, we need to start an analyzing in which spaces are we able to identify our innovation and technology from now because that, that aspect of us going back and saying, well, we missed the boat on X, Y, Z. Yes, we missed it on the first and second industrial revolution. It, it doesn't mean that we can't hop on on the fourth industrial revolution because that's still being future cast. It doesn't mean that our contributions to the integration of the internet versus the phone versus listening and auditory services mm -hmm. and other spaces are not valid. So for me, it's incredibly important that that story is being told because our innovation is on the continent. And what we're starting to learn and find out is because of the limitations of resources. So we are net we're not net energy producers. 
um, they call it the dark continent, if you will. But conservationists are looking at the way that uh, America, Europe, and others consume or use energy is detriments to the entire world's future. Yeah. So if you're able to find ways in which we cool water, the way that we are able to live in our cultural experiences and tap that in with the use of limited resources and scale that, all of a sudden, you're going to start future casting devices, gadgets, appliances that are more um, relatable to the environment that are less, that cause less conservation environmental damage. Mm -hmm. But no one is investing as deeply. No one is rewarding those intrinsic knowledge. So those indigenous tech, if you, what you would call it, are absent from the global marketplace. So when I say that, that's what I mean. I mean that on the continent, um, technology is an expression of our livelihoods. It's just commercialized and adopted in different marketplaces. Mm -hmm. So we need to have as much investment in it. And that's the sad, that's the challenge, honestly, um, for DARPA and the internet. And then because of, because of the research and development that went into DARPA and the setting up of the internet, we're seeing like Windows, um, Microsoft, we're seeing Facebook, Amazon, Benef those are additive. Yes. So w what is the technology we're, we're researching in as a continent that allows for the additive ideas that are almost a billion citizenries we think about and create all the time. So this is, that's, that's my advocacy that we do have it um, mm -hmm. it's here. We, there, there are patterns and ways. Asia's done it before. Um, they've done it with, in, in the early days, it was things like inventing paper, GAN powder. Mm -hmm. um, now they're looking to do it again through imitative technology and adapting it to Asian culture. I was in Singapore. The way they use Google Maps, actually, they don't use Google Maps. They have their own homegrown yeah. navigation system. It's like a video games with colors and words from, like, it's amazing. But they understand it and they're validated because the colors and words represents their cultural story. Mm. And, I, and, and, that's, and that's crucial. Now you mentioned something which is investment. So here's my question. What are the core things that you advise those of us in the diaspora to start investing in in the continent? What should we look for? How should we start investing? Because yesterday was the whole conversation of the year of return and, and all of that. And I know people were super excited, but how can we start saying, well, this is my money. How can I be part of this change? That's a great, great point. And I'm really always excited when people start to ask that question because it, it changes from wanting to have a short-term experience or engagement with the continent and saying, hey, this matters to me. Like when these people put their money towards something, um, it's a bit more than just a transactional interaction, right? I think that it's a great starting question, but the truth is that people from the diaspora should now say how then we create a relationship that leads to these economic wins and business decisions. Um, the reason I say this is because it would be great if we had homegrown funding channels that were unearthing all of these innovations that I'm speaking about. And then for the diaspora, all it was was a plug and play. Right. If that was the case, then they're actually venture capitalists and other um, historically wealthier funds that would come in and they would sweep the continent and make a killing of just yes. investing in that. So that is the challenge, but that's also the opportunity. So for those in the diaspora, similar to like my family, uh, has in the past, you need to be coming as partners and understanding what you're looking for and mm -hmm. understanding that you are bringing in access to another market. You are bringing in competence in a way that cannot be valued in dollars because white people are not going to put in that work. Um, privileged white, and I've worked for a couple of corporate organizations and their strategy fails on the continent because they're not going to put in that empathetic work and partnership. They, they're going to look at that opportunity space. So mm -hmm. for those in the diaspora, you, you cannot have that model and engagement and relationship building. The second aspect of that also is identifying that what you're looking for doesn't already exist, either mm -hmm. in your lived experience in the diaspora, or it exists in itself in very um, basic and foundational locally, but you are also future casting. So I think the expectation is that, hey, I'm in the diaspora, uh, I've been brought down to Ghana for Beyond the Return. I've been given a report for this. So this is what I'm going to see. Mm -hmm. If those things were also there, then the legacy business and then the politicians who've amassed the business, they won't wait for you to come down to exploit those opportunities. No, they will exploit you know, for themselves. Exactly. So those two perspectives are incredibly key. It's not so much about is there opportunity on the continent. It's there. 
It's not so much about is there an innovation here. To be honest, there's there are more white report, or reports from Global North um, and white consulting agencies about Africa's potential than I've read about um, local agencies sharing. They know, but that bridge and gap, that bridge in relationship, that bridge in creating something that we don't know it is, that openness and understanding that okay, this is something that is a collaboration for not just the continent and those on the continent to benefit, but for all Black people, whether in the diaspora and other places to benefit. Mm -hmm then it has to be a symbiotic relationship, not an additive relationship. You're not just okay. adding. You're it's actually not, a, not a transactional relationship. relationship. It, it has to be a partnership. Hmm. So, yeah, these are big conversations, and these are conversations that need to be uh, embedded. And you did just that because you mentioned you were the host of Empower Radio Show, and then you shifted to creating Unpacking Africa Show. But the... The fun part, you created it at the height of the pandemic. Why would you do this at the height of the pandemic? <laughs> um, so I think then packing Africa is, is one extension of my own personal growth. So Empower Show was specific to Accra. I was in Ghana. It was great. Because um, I, I, I mentioned earlier, whilst looking for a job, I was volunteering for a lot of things. And I was doing like, um, one of the things that I did was to share some of the stories of entrepreneurs in training at Mouse right. Water um, in Mast. And that was one of the first um, incubators on, on the African continent and specifically in West Africa. So I, had, I came into contact with over 200 um, entrepreneurs that I thought could come on the show. And mm -hmm. radio um, has, a, has a voice in place. Yeah. Um, but since then, I've lived in Mauritius and, and taught there. I've moved to South Africa, study, work, and transition here. Um, YFM's frequency doesn't make it out here. And so the, the other thing that has also changed is that um, I've become more of a, a believer of Pan-Africanism and then the, the idea that the market that we're playing in needs to be a lot larger than individual countries. Um, and, and that way, the catalyst for one expansion, um, the influence for a, a huge population that actually craves and demands it. I don't think people realize, we speak about a population dividend of young people coming in, but it's also like a loss of opportunity because we are far behind in creating those jobs or economic opportunity for a large population of young people. Mm -hmm. And so those things made me think of um, my research journey and, and unpacking Africa. So I started more a, a blog site that um, kind of followed a bit of my engagement with World Economic Farm, but also the, the Abuja Treaty and now the African Continental Free Trade Agreement. So the Abuja mm -hmm. Treaty wants an economic community and of itself yeah. and they have been regional blocks being built and then protocol for free movement and then fairly recently the ratification of the African continental free trade agreement so in the academic space and, and I'm, I'm really blessed I think I know friends of mine who are entrepreneurs and research is just something that's either they don't want to spend time or they don't have the capacity to and I know academics as well who really are not entrepreneurs. They would love to do the studies and, and let that. I am privileged enough to be able to dabble in both. And right. then the pain point is, it takes a while for you to have the academic papers. It takes a while for entrepreneurs to reflect and share their studies. There has to be a bridge. Yeah. So Unpacking Africa, then the block side became a bit of that. And then the podcast, because um, once the pandemic happened, there were two things that started to upset me. One was, the, the global north narration of why Africa and the pandemic hadn't affected Africa. So the expectation, like it was, it was actually quite, it was, it was, it was fascinating to me, but also I was a bit annoyed. Mm -hmm. Whilst they're going through their issues, they were finding time to, to try and predict how bad the devastation is yeah. going to happen on the continent. Um, so there, it was a large swath of that. And for me, what that did was it started to invalidate any thinking or any contributions that we may have had to it. Cause it was almost like, well, you guys, you can't, we're all going through the same things, but we're expecting you to be in a worse condition. So don't even try to so like future cast solutions for us. Uh, the audacity well, whilst you're dying. So for me, that, that actually pissed me off. Mm. Um, and, and typically, usually an initiative or project comes out of that. Um, but I'm also like astute enough to know that it's not rhetoric that goes counter to what is happening that solves it. It's, it's showcasing professionals. And, and I've been blessed to have a network of people, amazing people um, 
who've been on the guest uh, list so far that I and I still continue to curate. Who, when you hear their stories, like the doctor um, in South Africa, and you hear her day to day life and what medical black medical professionals are going through, you're like, wow. Mm-hmm. One, they're competent, but two, they're going through what you're going through, mm-hmm. or the the um, at the tech app that's been created to help us locally that works offline or online and the crowdsourcing funding model. So communities can then own and wrap it. You're like, Oh, Google, Google doesn't let me do that. So, so those are the things that wanted to, to bring on the stage um, and definitely made sure that is on Apple iTunes so that Karen's Becky's and John's could also listen and hopefully learn from some of that. Um, but it's critical that for those of us who are able to do it, do share in that way. So that's, that's really what Unpacking Africa continues to do. Um, there's a newsletter. Um, what the unintended consequence is that there are other folks who are also on the continent um, who want to reach a different demographic or audience. And so they're reaching out and saying, hey, can we partner? Yeah. Um, and I'm always for collaboration, especially when it educates, especially when it educates people who should have known better, but the opportunity is there. So I'm looking forward to translating it into that as well. Emmanuel, listen, I'm just in awe. Um, this conversation is really amazing. And thank you for to taking that moment and sharing with me. Um, I have a couple more questions. First and foremost, I was on your Twitter um, profile and your Twitter bio says, master of the moment. <laughs> I yeah. have friends that want to know. Okay, forget the friends. I want to know, what does this mean? What does this mean to you? No, it's crazy. It's something that I have, and I'm glad you mentioned it because I, I kind of forget. I have these, again, part, partly some of them translated to being mantras with my mom. I think I had this master of the moment almost five years ago. Mm-hmm. This was when I was working and before I gave myself reflective space and went to teach, and now I try to balance that in a bit. Master of the moment is that I'm, I need to be present. I think most of us, and for me, I, I feel this burden of sharing my story. I feel this family lineage of being an advocate and being engaged and involved that you can lose sight of the moment. And one of the things that um, at the height of my multimedia career, I used to miss because my memories of moments weren't what I did or how I felt. They were of me capturing somebody else. So when you have a professional life where it seems as if you're just documenting Um, you need to also have your own space to have a lived experience that's valued for you. And because of my, my history and my story, I would, I felt like one, I was owning uh, and and investing a lot heavily, heavier in the future, more than what my present could do. Mm -hmm. Um, So then that was a a public and personal reminder um, that I need to master my moments. Like this moment that I have with you is just as valid and well, and, and, valued for me as it is the aspirational moment where we have so many young um, kind of collaborative ecosystems between UK, US diaspora, Africa and local diaspora because somebody's Mm -hmm. hearing this and it triggers that right so the master of the moment really um, was was a set of tools that I needed for my own self to be present and I've realized that then it, it, it recharges me to be able to future cast and to collaborate in a way that I don't feel um, makes me feel like an empty vase or feels as if I'm just a shell for, for, the, for other people's um, aspirations and goals, but also for my own. Wow. It almost sounds like it's a self-care practice for you. It, it, yes. And I think five years ago, I didn't, I didn't know what self-care was. And I, and I appreciate folks like you and, and Brandy. I think that's one of the things that maybe in the next few years I'd love to do. I think what a lot of us don't talk about, and I, I was telling you about my close group of friends and feminist theory and others, um, there's some really brilliant women, um, both professors, both PhD candidates, personal friends and colleagues. And I think that within those spaces, they're able to speak and articulate things like self-care, um, way more than the groups where I'm with with my, my friends, my guy friends. I went to an all boys boarding school, so my fraternity brothers. We don't articulate those, the soft, um, or perceived to be soft but necessary spaces Mm -hmm. that also helps us in our being and so you're right um i think it's a great translation of for me the way i articulated it's like the master of the moment but really it is just reflective practice and and um, self-care space as well okay 
uh, we will talk about self-care and I think we may have to get you back at another time and, and go in a bit more into other conversations. You've talked about resilience. You've talked about so many different things. We've, we've unpacked, so to speak, Emmanuel in, a, in, in, in an, an hour and a bit. So I have just a couple more questions, but we've come to that point in the show where I want to ask, what is your so loud moment for the week? Oh, this has been, oh gosh, I, and I know you said something and, and I was like, this has been such a, uh, an interesting week because of the Black um, mm. Lives Matter and, and the communities are in, so it's, it's almost also been, how do I maintain my own sanity without going off the rails? But my so loud moment was really a um, conversation with the former president of the Shigong of okay. um, we had a We had a great um, opportunity for intergenerational exchange. Mm -hmm. And I did push back a little bit because um, he was sharing a very good story of during his 10 years president, he called Aliko Dangote into his office, summoned him from Lagos into Abuja, um, and was asking him why he was importing so much cement. I know this touches your heart, yes. So he calls uh, Aliko Dangote at, uh, at 5 a.m., asks him to show up at 7. Aliko is like, ah, oh God. But he makes it at 9. And then he asks that question, um, and then uh, Aliko Dangote says, well, the best way to get me to do that is to make, make it in such a way that policy requires that I have homegrown cement. And that also means that then, then it opens the door for him to advocate for um, tariff, uh, tax relief, and all that, and which has become the Dangote cement industry as we know it. Yeah. During the interaction, I was listening, and we were all excited. And I, I told Baba, uh, but Baba... All of us in our country, we don't have access to our president the way he did for you. And he was dead. He, <laughs> he died. He literally was cracking up. But, I, but I, it made me want to appreciate his journey and what he feels the influence is. So he was saying that current politicians should have a much more intentional relationship with captains of industry, with business people, um, with economies, both local and community members. Mm -hmm. And that, that disconnect really is what we're seeing because we don't have policy that then becomes... Continues. Yeah. What I was sharing was they should just stop looking at these handful of rich people who look like friends that they can call at five o'clock in the AM. And they should all probably they should probably be listening exactly to communities and clusters of groups of people that have shared interests. I I, I don't, we may not have Dangote lineage, but we're also part We have of that value. Idea. Yeah. Thank you. So th that is my also oh loud moment. Bam. And that is a moment to have. Can you imagine? Wow. That's a pushback. Because seriously, it, it is the cronyism that we complain about here that is at play. See, see you drinking tea? See what you started? See, let's just sip our tea. Let's just sip our tea and go. So before I let you go, I just have a couple more questions. And then you are done. So my last question... Second to last question, what are you currently reading or what was the last book you read? Second to last question, okay. Um, I'm, I, I'm terrible with books because most of what I'm doing is on research. Mm -hmm. um, so, okay, well, the last one that I had to read ahead of the interview I had was The Asian Aspiration. So okay. Dr. Greg Mills and um, former president Alyssa Gomez and Joe co-authored it with a Brent Hurst Institute. So it's, it's managed bread is on, is on, I, I want to find something that maybe your, your audience would find palatable. So I, I, I don't sound so academic. So, um, I do enjoy reading quite a lot of articles for some reason, like podcasts and articles, mm -hmm. snippets, um, outside of that. So the podcast that I enjoy, there's that diaspora diaries, there's a new podcast, um, that somebody shared a link that I'm looking to explore. Um, I think it's called the Playboy series from Ghana. It's really interesting. Okay. It's, yeah, it's, I think relationships from a, a Ghanaian man's standpoint, which I think mm -hmm. would be different, <laughs> but then of course, I hope they did you do well. So I just started that. Um, a lot of, I just subscribed to Barack Obama's medium. Okay. He had a couple of articles that he's been sharing as well that are, um, short and, and pithy about advocate. So, so it's actually fascinating. I think when, when folks are no longer responsible for a country, you can hear what they personally advocate without the pushback of their administration or of the course. compromise of... So, so yes, in summation, um, the Asian Aspiration, it's funded by the Brent Hurst Institute. It has a couple of authors, including 
for my president Alyssa Gomez Bessinger. That's that's one. Um, Barack Obama's Medium. That's another um, podcast of Black people. Any any podcast with Black people. Yours is great. Um, there's an, oh, another one that I like. Two two ladies and theirs is um, I think it's the fam- the business of family or family. I'll find it um, and I'll tell you that. But they they focus specifically on family businesses in Africa, okay. and so they have a whole podcast on breaking down what it means for to pass on generational wealth, governance structures, um, because the stats show that about 80% of the world's GNP um, is contributed to by families. So industries are built by families and on the continent, a lot of um, businesses that are running are owned by families, but for some reason they don't, they don't end, end up. Um, they don't su- survive generationally. generationally. And that's, that's in itself is a deeper topic because then we have to get into why why do we not create those systems but that's a different topic for another day uh, yeah. so i think the last question is what's the next project what's next for you and how can people connect with you um i think the connection really it's on the unpacking africa podcast for now um i do teach digital reputation and management and working with the university of Stellenbosch and a couple of institutions on that part um so Unpacking Africa, um, fourhouraafrica.co, EA Gamora, EA and my last name, Gamora on all socials. Okay. Um, I'm, I might create another channel for, for traveling or more or less for sharing arts and culture per country and that, mm-hmm. uh, because of the um, Beyond the Return. Okay. Um, and that, that would probably elevate the conversation beyond just visit Mauritius because we have resorts or visits. Kenya because of uh, wildlife conversations to, to a bit more on what, what are the ecosystems that are already available. So that will be a build up on a bit of what I'm doing on app unpacking Africa as well. That will be actually very cool. And so, well, you know what, Emmanuel, I cannot thank you enough for spending this time with me today. It's been illuminating. It's been um, or inspiring. And I'm just looking forward to seeing more of the things that you're doing. And listen, I am on, I let us find out how we as the show, me as a trainer coach can actually support the mission that you do. And yes, looking forward to seeing more from you. Thank you so much. Um, as, as you know, I'm an email away. So anyway, we can collaborate. I have to do so too. Awesome. Awesome. Folks, it's a wrap. You have heard it all. Emmanuel has shared his story. Go and discover about this man. Go and listen to his podcast. I'll put all the details below. You'll be able to find it. It'll be in the show notes. So thank you. Thank you for listening. And hey, you know what to do. You love the show. Give us an iTunes review. Find us, follow us. You know where to do so right now. We're on iTunes. We're on Google. We're on YouTube. You can find us. Just reach out to us. Looking forward to hearing from you. It's a wrap, folks. Bye.